All right. So welcome back, everyone. Uh, so today we're going to start talking about uh, concurrency. So this is going to be a sizable series of lectures. We'll talk about concurrency in this lecture, starting from the low-level primitives, uh, namely what happens at that hardware level and how to under how to come to terms with what the hardware is giving us for concurrency. And this is going to be this x86 TSO paper that you guys read for today. And then we'll follow up on this by sort of moving up the stack and looking at what this concurrency means for precisely reasoning about concurrent software. So uh, the next lecture on Thursday is going to be a paper looking at how in industry people find concurrency bugs. Uh, a state of art tool uh, from uh, last year's uh, systems conference will be the thing reading there. And then after that, we're going to move up and start to, uh, trying to understand how to formally reason about concurrent software and how to structure proofs, because that turns out to be very expensive in terms of effort and uh, hard to even get right in some way. That's the story. We're in the sort of concurrency section of the class now. Um, and uh, the reason we're reading this x86 TSO paper sort of uh, is to set the ground rules, as I said, for this problem of uh, shared memory concurrency. And by shared memory concurrency, I mean a situation that you probably all have in your computers and even in cell phones where you have multiple cores in your computer all running with access to the same memory, or at least in principle, the same memory could be accessed from all these CPUs. And multi-threaded code uh, could be written so that many threads are running on many cores and touching the same memory at the same time. And this kind of software is actually quite tricky to write. We'll uh, look at that problem today, as well as in Thursday's lecture. We're going to uh, uh, tackle that. Um, and as it turns out, the details matter hugely, at least at the lowest level. So this is going to be the focus of uh, this paper, trying to understand how the low-level hardware behaves when you have software running uh, on multiple cores sharing memory uh, locations. And part of the reason why this ends up being complicated is this notion of a weak memory model, or weak memory adds complexity to this whole story. And we'll look uh, shortly at what is exactly weak memory and uh, what is sort of, by exclusion, strong memory <laughs> that you might uh, think about. Um, uh, but uh, sort of the role of this paper in particular, uh, aside from setting the context for this whole line of uh, discussion in this class, is that that's a really nice example of what it means to specify a complex system. So this paper really sort of did a great job uh, of clarifying the model for how you should think about uh, shared memory for x86 processors. So x86 processors have a form of weak memory. They're pretty complicated to reason about. And the impressive thing about this paper is that that's like a really clear explanation of how you should think about this problem in your head. And it's not just for proofs, um, you know, not just uh, trying to prove something correct, but even getting things clear in your head, this is the paper to read, to understand what is uh, sort of a, as a starting point, what is the hardware doing for you? And that's an excellent example. Like some of the questions we got actually for this paper were like, what the hell is so complicated? Like the TSO model, it's beautiful, it's simple. Why, why, is, why was anyone confused? Uh, and I think it's a, really a testament to how well the authors of this paper cut through the irrelevant details and get at the heart of the problem of what is essential to reason about concurrency here in this uh, TSO world. And uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll try to see if we can you know, get some appreciation for this. But in some sense, yeah, this is an extremely crisp model of a hard problem to understand this behavior. And we'll, we'll look at some examples towards the end of the lecture where the Linux kernel developers, uh, sort of this amusing anecdote from the paper, spend weeks arguing about one line of code. And it turns out if they had the x86 TSO model, they probably could have concluded this thing in a couple of email messages and be done with it. Um, all right, so that's the context for this paper. And what, uh, what I wanted to sort of start off with is to explain the non-weak memory model. So the, the opposite of weak memory is what computer architects and in general, uh, people often call sequential consistency. And this is often abbreviated SC. So sequential consistency is a model of how multiple CPUs should interact when they're sharing a memory system. And the, the 
view you should have in your head is that in sequential consistency, you have a couple of CPUs running along and they are all running on top of a shared memory. Uh, and this is a logical view uh, in the sense that in reality, there might be additional elements somewhere in the uh, picture. There might be complicated buses involved. Uh, there might be caches. But all that's irrelevant. The sequential consistency model tells you how you should expect the system to behave, not necessarily how it's implemented. And the behavior for concurrent systems is uh, sort of, you can perhaps best think of it in terms of what are the atomic actions or steps. Because um, sort of this diagram looks like a perfectly fine diagram for any system you might imagine, both TSO and sequentially consistent memory. The real question in, in some sense is, what can we expect to happen atomically uh, so that we can think of our system as being just a sequence of atomic steps, a step here, a step there, a step there. And we never really have to consider the interleaving of steps. That's the essence of what it means to be atomic. And for sequential consistency, the unit of atomicity for execution is really a memory read and also a memory write. So what this means is that if some CPU reads address A, then it will atomically go to the memory, at least in this logical view, and get this value and return it to the application. And what it means to be atomic is that no other write can sneak in in the middle. It's either before some write or after some write. And similarly, writes are also atomic. When you write a value to an address, well, you get some kind of an OK back from the memory system. And that write happened in some logical instant in time. All the reads before return the previous value. All the reads after return the new value. So this is a very simple, intuitively, model for how your shared memory multi-core system should behave. And it's a nice model for two reasons. One is that it's actually used uh, in some simple, at least, hardware. So some uh, hardware systems, or in some configurations, actually provide this logical view of how this, the memory operates. Now, the reason I say simple is that, as you probably guessed from the paper, uh, it's critical for getting high performance to have a weaker memory model. In other words, achieving sequential consistency, this diagram that I've shown here, requires, as it turns out, fairly expensive things to happen at runtime. So modern multi-core processors and architectures don't provide sequential consistency because it's too slow. But that's sort of a good thing to know about, partly because of some simple hardware does provide it, but Probably more importantly, the reason that sequential consistency is so important is that it's a really clean abstraction for programmers, for developers. And <clears throat> the way to think of it is that even if the real hardware, as we'll talk about, does not provide sequential consistency, it's really cool if we could simulate sequential consistency, that programmers can program against this nice, clean view of the world and not worry about some of the complications that this paper talks about. So probably the most important reason why sequential consistency is important is really this clean abstraction that um, you hope programmers can uh, use in their head for the most part when writing at least uh, not super complicated low-level code here. All right, so that's the story for um, sequential consistency. Any questions about the sequential consistency part of the worldview so far? All right, so I wanted to start out here for sequential consistency with an example just to get our heads around what sequential consistency requires or uh, disallow or allows or disallows. And this is a, a very simple example we're going to look at where we have uh, basically two threads and uh, someone's going to call them. And there's going to be two memory locations, X and Y, roughly speaking. So thread one, uh, let me write out the code for you guys and then we'll talk about what it means. Thread one will write the value one to variable X and then it'll take, make a copy of whatever is another variable Y. And thread two over here is going to do the sort of symmetric opposite. It'll write one to variable Y 
and then it'll snapshot X. It'll read X and store it in X prime. And then the main driver thread, if you will, on the side, what it's going to do is you know, it'll initialize all these variables to zero, and then it'll spawn those two threads, spawn thread one and thread two, and then wait for them to complete in some way. And then the question is, what should we expect to see if we're going to print out X prime and Y prime over here? All right. So one way to think of it is uh, let's try to enumerate like all the possible values we could imagine getting here. So probably a natural output. So you know what are the possible results here? So one thing we could imagine is that perhaps we're gonna sort of run these threads at about equal speed. So you know this thread runs x equals one. This guy runs y equals one. Okay, and then they're gonna run their steps. In these yellow, then they sort of run the, the y prime and xy x prime steps. Well, in that case, what we should expect is that in sequential consistency is that we'll get one comma one because they both assigned ones to their respective locations and then they snapshot at their other memory location. Does that make sense? All right. So what are some other outputs that we could get? Could we get uh, zero one, for example? Any thoughts? Is that a possible outcome? Yes, uh, because if T2 went all the way down and then um, X is to a zero and then you print out, didn't T1 go? Yeah, so I think what you're saying is, okay, let's like execute this guy. And then, okay, so we have one in Y then we're going to get zero for X prime here because X hasn't been modified yet. Then we jump over here and run this code. Then we assign one to X, but it's too late for its snapshot. And then we assign the one from this Y over to this Y prime. Okay, so that seems possible. Cool. Um, the other case is also possible, one comma zero, because we just have sort of the opposite, you know, snake-like shape here. All right. So, Perhaps then the question is, could we also get zero comma zero in the sequentially consistent view of the world? So actually, one thing I should say is that uh, the re I drew this sort of nice blue line that describes how the code ran. And the fact that I can actually draw a blue line is sort of the essence of sequential consistency, because there is indeed some sequence of steps corresponding to the order indicated by my blue line that captures the execution. So the fact that I can draw such a line is exactly what sequential consistency means. The result is just like you, you, you ran the statements in some order. So the question is, could we get zero, zero now? Could we draw a blue line that gets us to print zero, zero at the end of this execution? I think you can't have that while maintaining sequential consistency. I think they kind of mentioned this idea in the paper like you can't interleave the different steps of the threads in a way that will give you zero, zero. Yeah, so one way sort of you could imagine why this should be impossible is you could imagine, well, you know, either this snapshot happens first or this snapshot happens first. They're kind of symmetric. So let's imagine like, let's suppose this snapshot happens first. Well, if this snapshot happens first, then this means by the time it happens, we already wrote the value one to X. So that one happened first. This one hasn't run yet. Then by the time, you know, maybe this guy ran or not, but eventually we're then going to get to here. We already assigned one to X. Then this was the first snapshot statement to run. Then we get here. It should pick up the one because of this sort of pink line. We assigned one to X. It should get picked up here. So indeed, you're right that in sequential consistency, this is impossible to get, but yet this is actually all possible in weak memory. So all these guys are okay in various weak memory models and pretty much all weak memory models, there's many of them, pretty much all of them are gonna allow zero, zero in some form. Uh, but only the first three are okay in sequential consistency. And this is sort of the crux of it. This is like a pretty weird behavior. How do you think about your program 
uh, printing zero, zero, when there's no order in which you could run these statements to get this zero, zero outcome. So this is sort of the, 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 the crux of what weak memory models are. They're really trying, they're sort of providing fairly complicated execution environment on which you run in the shared memory model. Um, and um, the reason for that is really all about performance. It turns out that um, you can get much higher performance, as I mentioned, processors, if you can play certain tricks that manifest themselves in these weak memory behaviors. All right, so does that make sense? Any questions about sort of this uh, zero, zero outcome or anything else going on here before we jump into the sort of weak memory hardware and trying to understand what causes this behavior? All right, so let's try to um, look at what reality is. So, so far we've looked at the sequentially consistent model and uh, you know, it excludes the zero, zero thing, but in real hardware it happens. So let's try to understand what is going on in real hardware for shared memory. So the picture for real hardware is Kind of complicated. Uh, real hardware is complicated, um, and um, maybe the sort of starting point um, for much of this discussion is going to be um, sort of well, maybe the, the the lowest level unit here is a core. We'll talk about the details there in a second. Uh, so there's often something called a core in today's architectures where execution actually happens. So this is a core is something that runs instructions for you, runs a thread of code. And a core has uh, some uh, you know, non-trivial structures in it. It has an L1 and an L2 cache. These are uh, hardware buffers or sort of caches that store copies of memory locations. Um, and there might be many such cores in a system. They might have many cores, each with all, their own L1 and L2 cache. And um, one interesting thing is that there's a different uh, hardware designs have different relationships between addresses and different caches. So this is uh, what's sort of generally known as a cache coherence protocol. Um, these caches have to make sure that the values they store are not just arbitrary values, but have some relation to what is stored in main memory or other caches. So there's a fairly complicated protocol that runs between these cores and their caches and the rest of the system to make sure that the caches are in some kind of a consistent state. Um, and some of these protocols require that the caches never store the same uh, memory locations at the same time. So uh, uh, that was often called exclusive protocols or, uh, uh, and there's inclusive protocols where uh, one cache must be a subset of a different cache. So we're not gonna dive into the details, but this is more to illustrate that there's a lot of uh, complexity going on in uh, the real hardware implementing this shared memory system. And these cores typically all belong uh, to something called a CPU or a socket, uh, depending on the terminology. This is often a physical thing that's sitting in your computer, a chip perhaps. Uh, and uh, these guys often have some other kind of an L3 cache, which is basically more cache memory, uh, storing uh, copies of uh, data from main memory. And there's some interconnect here. Uh, and uh, these caches interconnect. Uh, and then underneath of all this is, of course, the shared uh, DRAM. Uh, but even that ends up often being partitioned. So modern machines actually attach DRAM directly to these sockets. And uh, there isn't a necessarily a single memory. So in uh, higher end uh, machines, you might actually have multiple CPUs or sockets in a uh, single socket here, multiple CPU or sockets in a single computer. And the way this looks is actually you have another socket with the same sort of core structure in, inside of it. And there's an L3 cache as well. And the sockets are connected by some kind of an interconnect link. Uh, this is for example, QPI in Intel's case. Um, and each socket actually might have its own DRAM. So here's more DRAM, also shared DRAM, um, attached to a different socket. And there's a memory controller as a result in every socket in your computer system. And the thing to sort of realize here is that the contents of memory is spread out all over this complicated system, right? So a single memory location could be stored here, 
could be stored here. Like the, the right value of a certain memory location might be here, might be here, might be in different L3 caches over there, over here, might be in different L1s or L2s, might be in L1s or L2s on a different socket. So there's many places where a value could appear and actually probably many copies of this value, maybe different states actually really exist at the same time in the system. So it's actually not terribly surprising looking at this complex picture to imagine that, wow, this is going to have complex behaviors. And there are uh, some things that I haven't even drawn on this picture yet. So for example, each core typically has some kind of a store buffer. Uh, so a store buffer on every core where all of the writes go and each core has one of these store buffers that accepts writes. So if your thread is running here and issues a memory write, it actually goes into the store buffer, then goes into the cache. And of course, the write value of any location might even be in the store buffer rather than the cache yet. Um, so that's sort of the complicated picture of the memory system of a uh, modern uh, multi-core machine. And um, maybe the main point to take away from this is the many locations, many green dots here indicate all the different places where you might find the right value of a given uh, memory address or di different even versions of that right. So does that make sense? A bit of an overview, but uh, happy to answer questions if you guys have, have something you want to ask. All right, so another dimension that I wanted to point out for why real hardware is pretty complicated uh, has to do with the execution model. So, so far I've drawn a diagram that describes where things are stored in a shared memory multi-core system. Uh, but another dimension to this is how instructions are executed. And in particular, most modern processors have out of order execution and what I mean by this is that a processor, in order to get high performance, is going to run many instructions at the same time uh, so that it can run them faster in total. So if you remember our previous example, we had threads that were doing something like store one to the value x, and then we would try to snapshot the value of y. That was the example from the previous slide. So the way this might look like to the processor is that there's an instruction to store one into location x, then you read a temporary value into a temporary register, um, you know, you fetch the location y, and then you store this temporary value that you fetched back into location y prime. And the reason to split up these statements is because they are independent units. The, the whole y prime equals y is not an atomic unit, but reading y and then storing the result into y prime are two separate atomic steps here. So the out of order execution aspect of these modern processors means that you might actually be running both of these or actually maybe even all three of these operations. Well, in this example, just two of these operations, but you might be running sort of this guy and this guy at the same time, in particular, because if the addresses are independent, the processor might decide, hey, you know, I can run the store and fetch the Y at the same time. And in some sense, you might actually get the value of Y before you finished executing the store instruction. And depending on what your hardware says is allowed or not, well, maybe you'll observe some weird effect because your hardware happened to have run this fetch first, it appears, before it finalized the store instruction. That could be yet another source of weird behaviors. And perhaps the most extreme form of uh, weird executions is uh, speculative execution, which you can think of as maybe a more extreme form of out of order execution. So in this out of order execution processors run many instructions. They're all going to run. They just run at the same time for performance, like the store and the fetch. But in speculative execution, the processor might even guess as to what the future instructions might be, and it'll run them. If it guessed wrong, it'll have to undo the side effects, and maybe that's okay. Uh, but if it gets right, well, you just happen to have executed some stuff from the future already. You can run that much faster. And there's all kinds of crazy forms of speculative execution. Uh, maybe the sort of one particularly surprising thing is processors actually guess at the values of pointers in some architectures. Um, so you can have a situation like this where uh, let's imagine we have thread one over here. Uh, that does something like, you know, I allocated a memory location and I store into that pointer 
some value x over here. And then I publish that pointer in a sense. So I store it in some kind of a shared variable, shared equals PTR. So I put some value into my pointer and I publish it for other threads to see. So one line of reasoning for this might be that, well, if other threads grab my shared pointer and try to access it, well, if they grab the shared pointer, they uh, will necessarily see my value X because I stored X first. How could they even look at the value of this pointer or what's stored at this pointer location if they didn't read the shared variable? Well, another thread might be doing exactly this. So, uh, you know, it assigns to variable P is shared. So it reads the shared pointer and then does something like, I don't know, print the value of star P. So it grabs the shared pointer and then prints its value. Well, some processors are actually extremely aggressive at speculating and some hardware actually speculates about the value of the pointer. So naively, you might think, well, to reference the pointer, you have to know what the value of the pointer is. So you got to first read from memory. You got to read the shared location. Some fancy hardware actually guesses that the value P might be something. If it saw this code run over and over and over again, and always the same pointer shows up, well, it will guess it, but that's the P. And then it'll actually read the star P value before it even finishes reading the shared pointer. And then it'll check later that it guessed correctly but the end result is going to be something crazy where this thread two actually reads star P before this assignment happens even, or potentially, uh, and it might actually go before this assignment to star PTR. All kinds of weird effects, both because of the complex memory hierarchy, as indicated by the many places where you see green dots here, and a very complex execution model uh, that you see on the right. So processors do lots of things at the same time. And all of this makes it quite difficult to understand what you're going to see when you run some software on the shared memory machine. That makes sense? Questions about this uh, setup so far? Sorry, could you just review why you would use speculative execution again? Hey, it's all for performance. Uh, so the why is indeed, so uh, the sort of traditional example of speculative execution is you have some kind of code that says, you know, if, uh, you know, some condition A, then do this, otherwise uh, do something else. So the question is, uh, the processor is trying to figure out what is A. And uh, maybe A requires loading something from memory. Maybe A is literal, just a memory location. So you need to load A and then decide whether to go here or here. And just for some constant numbers, loading from memory takes you know, probably a hundred cycles, maybe a couple hundred cycles, depending on the machine you're using. What should your CPU be doing while it's waiting for A to load? Well, the sort of traditional old, uh, you know, or like naive architectures would just wait for a hundred cycles. That uh, is pretty slow, or like you have a hundred cycles where the processor is not doing anything. So clever architects figured out that, well, let's just suppose A was true, or I don't know, guess something. Maybe they maintain some history over time. They think that, well, you know, this if statement, we saw it before, last time it was true. So let's try it again. So they're gonna basically start executing the code here, hoping that when A finishes loading, it's gonna be true. And if they guessed correctly, then they're in good shape in terms of performance because they guessed that A was true. They already ran this code. So they're ahead of the game. They didn't waste those 100 cycles. Now they can resume running at this point where they sort of got to. Really good for performance. Now, of course, if they guessed A wrong, they now have to clean up all the state. So the processor does a lot of careful bookkeeping to be able to undo all these changes if needed. But uh, that's the sort of game that many processors play for performance is to speculate on things. Sort of most maybe, or the initial sort of motivation was really for speculating on branches because branches are a very clear place where you just don't even know what other code to start running before you figure out which way the branch went. Um, but there's many more aggressive forms of speculation like this speculation on pointer values that I described in the example with T1 and T2. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Cool, yeah, sure. Any other questions on this slide? All right, 
So the last uh, sort of complication I want to add here that's going to sort of motivate the next example is um, recent processors, well, I guess maybe recent in the sense of like last decade or two, uh, <laughs> have a feature called hardware threads. So it's not just that a core is running one uh, thread, but actually there's many threads indicated by these HT boxes over here. And what's going on is that these hyper threads are kind of a lightweight thing going on inside of a core. And they mostly share all the stuff going on in a course. So they share the L1 and L2 cache. They share execution units. They share some of the speculation machinery and so on. Um, but then sort of a question that might be, well, do these hyper threads share the store buffer? And is that OK? You could imagine either answer, like at the level of the diagram I'm drawing here, what the heck? We could give one of these guys a separate store buffer, or maybe not. Uh, <laughs> So let's look at some examples and see what would be the effect if we have hyper threads that each have their own store buffer here versus hyper threads that sit in a core and execute concurrently, but share the same store buffer. And the example I want to talk about in this context is this uh, somewhat elaborate <laughs> litmus test that the paper talks about called independent reads of independent rights. And this is the IRIW thing that the paper refers to. And what's going on in this example at some level uh, seems fairly easy to talk about, but then we'll get into how this can go wrong in our hyper-threading example. So the story is we got four threads. But they're actually doing very simple stuff. So thread one, the only thing it's doing is it actually writes one to x. That's the only thing. And then we have thread two. Its only job in life is to write one to y. And then we have these other two threads, thread three and thread four. And their job is going to be to read x and y in some order. So what we're going to see here is that uh, let's call this x3. Uh, x3 is going to be the value of x and y3 is going to be the value of y. So this guy reads x and then y and thread four is going to read them in the opposite order. It'll read y first and then x. The question is what values could we see? So this guy is going to get some pair of x and y. This guy is going to get some pair of x and y. So just to set some ground rules, right? Like, oh, of course, we could get sort of 0, 0 here and 0, 0 here. That would happen if T3 and T4 ran first before 1 and 2 ran at all. Easy enough. We could also get 1, 1 if, if we did all the writes first, and then we did the reads in threads 3 and 4. We could also get all kinds of other values. So for example, if T1 ran, but T2 didn't run yet, then of course, this guy will see x written, but y not. And here also, it will see that. And we can see that as well, the opposite, meaning that if t2 ran, then we did all the reads. And then we finally did t1. That will correspond to this line. So all these sort of pairs of outcomes are all possible. Hopefully that makes sense. And the weird question is, whether it's possible for T3 and T4 to observe different outcomes. And in particular, the, like, the really weird case that the paper talks about is, could we have the case where T3 reports 1, 0? This was one of the allowed outcomes here. But T1, T4 reports 0, 1. So is this combination actually possible? So just to walk you through what this would mean, well, this means if, if we've got 1, 0 here and 0, 1 here, that means that this thread saw a 1 in this location. So maybe let me start annotating this picture. So we must have seen a 1 over here. But then somehow we got a 0 over here by the time we read the y. So it's almost like the right to x happened first because we saw it. But then the right to y happened later, because when we looked afterwards, it still wasn't there. And on t4, what happened is that actually we saw y being 1 
But then when we looked at X, it was still zero. So from T4's perspective, it's as if Y got written first by thread two, but then X was written much later because we saw Y and then X was still zero. So it must have happened afterwards. This is a particularly weird behavior. Uh, hopefully uh, you get some sense that this is indeed kind of a strange thing to happen because it's not even clear in what order did X and Y get written. One thread thinks X was written first, another thread thinks Y was written first. So does that make sense? What we're sort of grappling with here, the different orders in which these variables appear to have been written. All right. So the funny thing here is that um, as far as the paper talks about, this should not be possible on x86. And this is not possible in their model as well, not on x86 TSO either. We'll talk about this in a, in a bit. Um, but just to give you some appreciation for how these subtle details really manifest themselves, if we had this picture we were talking about on the previous slide where different hyper threads share a store buffer, then it's totally possible to get this outcome. And the way that this is actually possible to get this outcome is that you might actually have these threads sharing the same core. So in order to observe this weird outcome, what would have to happen is that basically T1 and T3 have to share uh, basically hyper threads on one core. And then we have this other pair of T2 and T4. These guys are going to share hyper threads on a different core. So they're sort of coupled behind the scenes. So what's going to happen in order to explain to you now how we might arrive at this bizarre outcome? Well, what's going to happen is that this guy goes actually into the store buffer of our shared core, the orange core. So this x equals 1 goes into the store buffer of the orange core, and it's shared with t3 because t3 is running on the same core sharing that store buffer. And this is in the hypothetical world where store buffers are shared between hyperthreads. Well, in this case, yeah, it's pretty clear why it got the one. It's actually from the store buffer. And it's clear how it gets the zero. It's actually from memory, because nothing has been written to memory yet. And you can also see how the other thing happens. The y also goes to the store buffer. And because the store buffer is shared, this actually is clear. It comes out of the same store buffer. But then the zero is coming out of memory because the memory has not been updated yet. The other X is sitting in the orange store buffer so far. Does this example make sense? Any questions about this? I think the main point of this example is to illustrate how really subtle some of these decisions are at the hardware level. So I was drawing this diagram on the previous slide that we can flip back to with all kinds of things flying around, caches and sockets and DRAMs and interconnects and hyperthreads and store buffers, and even silly little details almost, uh, like the question of is there one store buffer per core that's shared by hyperthreads or is there multiple ones? Matters hugely, as we saw, uh, because you might have a behavior that's possible one and not the other. You might imagine other things also matter, like should each hyperthread have its own L1 cache or L2 cache? All tricky stuff to reason about. And this is partly why there was, was an extreme amount of confusion in this space before the x86 paper, x86 TSO paper, sort of straightened it out in a sense and made it much easier to reason about. So one thing you guys might be wondering is how the hell does anyone write anything sensible on top of this hardware? So how do you program uh, on weak memory? Uh, concurrent programming is hard enough, easy to forget locks and all the stuff you probably encountered as well. Uh, but on top of this weak memory model, things seem very crazy because even statements involving, I don't know, four thread, four lines of code or six lines of code on the slide are extremely hard to reason about and require knowing what your architecture is doing under the covers. Uh, so the answer is basically to a first approximation, most code uh, simulates sequential consistency. And the way you simulate sequential consistency is probably using locks or maybe uh, some other fancier machinery, but locks are, to a first approximation, the way to go, or uh, maybe even coarse or grained partitioning of your data. 
Um, but uh, it turns out simulating sequential consistency doesn't always work out. Um, and you might actually want a more general answer. Um, and the more general answer might be, well, you know, suppose that you're implementing the lock itself. So if you're implementing a lock, the lock is the thing that's actually going to simulate sequential consistency. So you can't assume SC yet. Or if you want to implement some lock-free code um, uh, for performance. So for example, Linux has this thing uh, in the kernel called RCU, which is a fancy technique to get fairly high performance shared memory data structures without uh, simulating sequential consistency. And it does kind of like this pointer publishing trick that I described in an earlier board, where you update some memory locations, and then you put a pointer into some shared location for other cores to look at. Uh, but mostly this is to say that there are actually important situations where you really need to reason about stuff below the sequential consistency illusion, if you will. And the answer here is basically for x86 processors, it's this basically x86 TSO model. And it's a very crisp abstraction. We're going to sort of jump to talk about it now. Um, but it really helps programmers figure out how to write code because the diagrams on this previous board, these are inscrutable. If you need to write code and you have to reason about all these green dots and all these out of order and speculative execution things, that is nuts. You're never going to succeed. And x86 TSO really captures the essence of what you have to worry about and what you don't have to worry about. And for that reason, it's really a nice, uh, nice thing to have. So let's talk about what this x86 TSO model is. Uh, before we sort of jump into the details, any questions about, about the setup so far? All right, so let's talk about the actual model now. So the way to think of this model, it's really a, what, what's called an abstract machine. And we'll talk about other ways you could have specified it. And in particular, the Intel and AMD manuals specify shared memory in a very different way. Good for some things, bad for others. Um, but what it means to specify uh, shared memory through an abstract machine is that this is kind of like an illusion. This is almost like a cartoon picture of a computer that you can keep in your head. And you can imagine it's running on this cartoon picture of a machine. And you'll be pretty much right uh, about what can happen even though you're thinking about this cartoon view of the world and not the real thing. And this abstract machine view that the x86 TSO authors propose uh, basically talks about hardware threads, or these hyper thread things. So you might have hyper thread zero over here, and you have hyper thread one, and all these guys comprising your computer. And um, this is the only sort of unit of execution. You don't have to worry about sockets or caches. Uh, you just have to worry about these hardware threads. And then at the very bottom of this picture, we're going to have shared memory. And again, we can ignore the details about multiple DRAM controllers or multiple sockets. There's just one shared memory at the bottom of the world. And the thing sort of connecting these hyper threads running our code or hardware threads running our code to the shared memory is a store buffer. That's the only thing you really have to keep in mind. So there's a store buffer here that's going to keep the writes coming out of this hardware thread. And um, similarly, a store buffer over here. And the data flow is that writes actually go into the store buffer. And then when the thread tries to read, well, you might read from your store buffer if the address you're reading is in the store buffer. And otherwise, you're just going to read from main memory. That's sort of the data flow picture. And then eventually, the store buffer will flush back to shared memory. And this picture repeats for all of these other hardware threads. All right. And then the only other sort of part of this picture is there's a, a way to make some things atomic using a lock prefix. So you can really force some bigger things to be atomic. We'll talk about the unit of animacy in, in a second. But basically, you can sort of take this whole memory subsystem uh, in this yellow region and you can lock it. And what it means to lock uh, is that you can make something uh, more than a sort of a single, maybe, uh, right atomic. 
Any questions about this picture? Hopefully this makes sense. This is almost uh, the same picture that's in the paper. So the thing that we haven't really talked about yet is the question of what are the atomic steps? So very much like I was talking about in the sequential consistency view of the world, in sequential consistency, the things that were atomic were each memory read and write. That was atomic. It went all the way to memory and went uh, or from memory, depending on reading or writing. And here, the story for TSO is a little bit more complicated, uh, capturing this uh, sort of store buffer. And the rule is basically, if you do a read, that's actually atomic. The reads either from the store buffer or memory, those guys happen in one atomic step. So either you read from a store buffer, that's not interleaved with anyone else, or you read from memory, also not interleaved with anyone storing or uh, flushing to memory, et cetera. The writes are where the difference happens. The, uh, the thing that you can do atomically is you can write to the store buffer. You can't go to memory or typical writes don't go all the way to memory atomically. They just go to your store buffer. And this is sort of the big difference from sequential consistency um, that these writes are not an atomic thing that goes all the way to memory. And then, of course, you could flush from the store buffer. And uh, anything that's sort of present in the store buffer, any of these entries, could be taken one by one and flushed in the background um, or explicitly. Uh, so there's a, a fence instruction that software can execute to force uh, things to drop down into shared memory from your store buffer. So you can wait for all of it to get flushed. Or there's also uh, what the paper talks about as a tau transition, which is a background step that can happen anytime. Uh, doesn't, it's atomic, meaning that it doesn't sort of interfere with other operations and jump in the middle there. Uh, but it does happen in the background. You can take anything from your store buffer and flush a part of it, or sort of some, some things at the bottom of your store buffer, flush them into shared memory. That makes sense? And then the last thing is that uh, there's this locked operation. Uh, so you can basically make any uh, opcode that you want to run on your hardware thread locked uh, by grabbing some kind of this orange lock. And what that means is that your instruction will sort of run atomically uh, and um, flush the buffer, flush your store buffer. What I mean by this is that if you take an opcode or some instruction you want to run and make it locked, then your whole instruction will grab the lock, run your instruction, write, read, whatever it wants to do, and then flush the store buffer. All that happens as one unit before anyone else gets a chance to run. And maybe the craziest thing here is that indeed, it, like it runs your opcode and flushes it all the way out to memory. And that all happens before anyone else gets a chance to read. They can't observe another read, can't go in the middle of your sort of complicated locked op uh, and can't see things that I can see contents in memory before you finish flushing the buffer. This whole thing, the op and the flush, become an atomic unit here. Does that make sense? All right. So one thing that we can um, now use this abstract machine to see is how our previous example um, was returning two zeros. So to remind you, we have this example we were talking about earlier on, where we had two threads. And they were doing x equals one, and then y prime equals y. And here we had y equals one, x prime equals x. So uh, the thing we observed is that zero zero was not possible in SC, not allowed. But with this abstract machine in mind for x86 TSO, it's actually not too difficult to figure out how this behavior, how zero zero could be observed on a weak memory machine like this x86 TSO. So the way to think of it is that, well, thread one is going to run this statement, and this is going to go into the store buffer. But it's not going to memory yet. And then y on this guy also runs and goes into the store buffer, but hasn't flushed yet either. And then when the threads go on and read the y, well, this actually comes from memory, where it hasn't been updated yet because the write went into the store buffer. And similarly, this guy gets a zero from memory because x is right is sitting in thread one's store buffer. 
That makes sense. Questions about how to think about getting zero zero in this x86 TSO model? So this is a sort of what the cool thing, just to reiterate, because it is so cool that you could really understand that complicated machine we were drawing just by thinking about this abstract cartoon picture of what x86 TSO means. And we can understand that, yep, you can get zero, zero by just thinking about what goes into what store buffer. All right, so one thing I want to do now is uh, sort of uh, have you guys go into breakout rooms and uh, answer this question that we had for the paper. And the question really has to do with the fact that the abstract machine we've described so far talks about hardware threads, right? So these HTs, these are hardware threads. And there, I don't know, there's some fixed number of them, like maybe my laptop has eight of them, and that's it. But the software you write, unless you're writing an OS kernel, you're not running directly on top of the hardware. You have OS threads. So what does x86 TSO mean for an OS thread? Is there any relation or is x86 TSO useful if you're writing software on top of an operating system? You might have hundreds of OS threads, but you only have eight hardware threads. So what's the story there? How do you use x86 TSO or is the x86 TSO even the model there? for user space applications. All right, any questions before we jump in to chat about this for 10 minutes or so? All right, see you guys back in 10 minutes. All right, welcome back everyone. So what do you guys think? What's the story for operating system threads for this weak memory? Anyone wanna jump in from either group? I guess I can pick on some names. Uh, how about Julian? Yeah, sure. So one of the things that we were saying is that uh, like the idea for x86 TSO is that um, like it's, it's an abstract like representation of what this is doing. And so we use this machine style, but it's not like necessarily tied to the like specific hardware architecture. And so um, like by that logic, we were saying that, yeah, you can also like think about this the same way for, for OS threads. Cause it's just kind of a way to reason about how it's, how it's using threads. It's not like necessarily specific to the hardware. It's more of an abstract representation. Fair enough. Okay. So yeah, so good point. So you're basically saying that you could totally instantiate x86 TSO by having you know, I don't know, a, a thousand logical hardware threads that are representing each OS process or each OS thread as like an x86 TSO hardware thread. And that's the spec. So yeah, so certainly it's possible to talk about the spec. Um, so, you know, OS processes, um, you can talk about, yeah, so you have like a process and a store buffer. And you have another process and a store buffer and, and so on. And you can have one of these per OS process yeah, good point. So, okay, so we can certainly talk about the OS providing an x86 TSO abstraction. So, from the other group, what do you guys think? Uh, Eileen, maybe? Yeah, I guess we kind of talked about um, in terms of the application code, like it, the developer does need to make sure that it is following like locking and all those kinds of procedures for sequential consistency to hold. So if that doesn't happen, then you actually can kind of start thinking about concurrency and weird situations that could happen. Um, honestly, I wasn't the most clear on this, but I think we did have a good discussion within the group. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, so I think you're right that uh, somewhere locking has to happen probably in the application code if they wanna uh, sort of get sequential consistency. Yeah, that's almost, almost certainly every application has some flavor of that going on. Um, but then uh, in the application code, there's going to be an implementation of a lock function, which needs to reason about oh, how the lock is implemented. And it probably does so by sort of thinking about x86 TSO instantiated for OS processes, um, like Julia mentioned. Uh, one interesting aspect of it um, has to do with the question of how do you reconcile the x, like what's the relationship between the x86 TSO model for OS threats that we have drawn here and 
at the hardware level, you have probably some fixed number of cores, like maybe two cores in this, my example here. Um, you have two hardware threads, and they're providing x86 TSO at the hardware level. And the way to think of this is this is almost the same kind of a abstraction relation that has to hold uh, between the state of the OS threads and the hardware threads. So this is the logical spec, and the implementation is just two hardware threads. And the abstraction relation is actually, I think, surprisingly simple. So basically, the, the, the abstraction relation really has to do with the question of whether an OS process is currently running on some thread or not. So basically, the abstraction relation says something of the form, if you know some process running on you know, hardware threads, then the store buffers are the same. Basically, uh, to sort of maybe draw this picture here, if this guy is running on this hardware threads, um, then this guy's logical store buffer, as far as the OS is concerned, is the same as his real store buffer in hardware. That's what the store buffer at the OS spec level looks like. And then the other case is that if the process is not running, then the OS level store buffer is empty. So that basically says that everyone else has nothing in their store buffer unless they're running on a CPU. And the reason that operating systems maintain this invariant is to basically allow context switching. So if you were a process running on one hardware thread and then you move to another hardware thread, then it's important that you don't get some weird new store buffer that you weren't expecting. The way to think of this happening is that before the OS can move you from one hardware thread to another, it has to flush your store buffer to make it empty so that you're not running on any thread. You have an empty store buffer. And then if you have an empty store buffer, the OS can take any thread that's not currently running, it has an empty store buffer, and plop it down on a hardware thread of its choice. And the only thing it has to make sure is that it actually has to first flush the store buffer on that hardware thread before putting the OS thread there. So does that make sense? There's a somewhat intuitive, perhaps, abstraction relation between OS threads and the hardware threads. And the main rule, basically, is that you got to keep flushing your store buffer whenever you take OS threads in or out of a hardware thread. Well, suppose you didn't. I think if you didn't, then you would have the same weird behavior that we saw with the IRIW example. So if you have two threads sharing a store buffer, you could, like we, we were talking about two hyper threads sharing, sharing, we were talking about two hyper threads sharing a store buffer, we could observe this behavior. Let me flip back to this slide. We observed this behavior, which was not possible in x86 TSO, but we saw we saw that it was possible if we we're sharing store buffers between threads. So I think if you didn't flush the store buffer when context switching, you could observe these IRIW behaviors on an x86 TSO machine where the observation would happen at the OS x86 TSO level. And the processes would observe IRIW even though the hardware never exposes it. Uh, I was going to also add, I think one thing we talked about in our group uh, was Besides, I guess, the IRIW thing, you could also have a case where, like, you do, uh, you know, you write uh, to a shared variable X, you assign one, then you do a comparison, like, if X is zero, then panic, otherwise do whatever. Uh, and if you get scheduled out of your current hardware thread into a different one right after the X equals one and the store buffer wasn't flushed, you might see the old value of X equals zero. Uh, even though you're only one thread, you're the only one that ever reads and writes to X. Uh, so you don't even oh, get yeah, that's a good point. Right? Yeah, that would be totally bizarre. Just to explain this example that Upamanyu just described, you're running on this thread, you wrote x equals 1, and it's even simpler code. You first, uh, let me write this aside here, you write x equals 1, then y equals x. What Upamanyu is saying that, first off, you would run on one thread, this would go into your store buffer. Then you move to a different CPU where your store buffer is not there, and now you read x, you get 0 because your store buffer is gone. That would be pretty bizarre. So indeed, this is another reason why you have to flush the store buffer when moving. Um, luckily, it's actually pretty easy to do this. Uh, and the reason this actually ends up working out pretty nicely is that at least on x86, OS kernels run an instruction called IRAT 
to go from user from kernel space to user space. Um, and this instruction happens to flush the store buffer. Uh, so this uh, solves most of the story for you, uh, uh, at least on, when you're uh, taking a thread out of a uh, hardware thread. A little bit more to the story, but most of it actually is done by the fact that IRET on x86 uh, is an instruction that flushes the store buffer. So I think the abstraction relation is a little bit more complicated. If you just look at this example, as you migrate from one hardware thread to another, your store buffer can shrink at the physical level, oh, but, the, the cool but not at the abstract level. Well, the abstract level, it could totally shrink because if you remember the abstract spec said that- Oh, oh you just simulate, I see, yeah. You, you indeed, so it's highly important that the abstract spec allow this tau transition that like at any time, it's okay to flush the store buffer and this is exactly what the OS would be taking advantage of. It would say, well, I am justified in flushing your store buffer whenever I feel like, and in particular, I will feel like it when I'm context switching you. Right, right, it empties the entire thing. Yeah, so, but yeah, good point. But uh, it's important that this background flush is allowed. Otherwise, we would be in trouble. Otherwise, you could like use the store buffer as a private scratch space for all kinds of crazy stuff. Then <laughs> this is not gonna be visible, uh, yeah. Okay, makes sense. And other questions about this uh, issue? All right. So the last thing I wanted to talk about is really the alternative way to specify uh, shared memory concurrency. Uh, and in the paper, this is sort of exemplified by the Intel and AMD specifications for shared memory because you know, these guys actually sell you chips that do something and they feel compelled to describe what the chips do, including what their shared memory behavior is. And there's quite a bit that uh, Intel and AMD tried to say about um, how their processors behave under shared memory uh, concurrency. And um, that's kind of a weird kind of a spec, right? Like, first off, it's not formal, even, it's not as formal as x86 TSO even, uh, but what, the specs mostly boil down to is things that Intel and AMD called uh, these like principles. So for example, one principle uh, was, you know, processors respect causality. Oh, I think it's like P5 or P6 that the paper refers to. Uh, not, not super clear uh, what exactly this means, partly because the spec is written in English prose and it talks about things that are not exactly fully defined. And the other part of the spec uh, came up through these litmus tests. Uh, and litmus tests were basically a short snippets of code, like we were talking about in uh, the boards in this lecture. So for example, this snippet of code from an earlier board where we had X equals one, Y equals one, et cetera, or this IRAW thing that we looked at before as well. So that, those are examples of litmus tests that Intel and AMD would publish. And their spec would say, look at this litmus test. You should never observe this, for example. So prohibiting a certain outcome of a litmus test was kind of the, their way of specifying what the hardware is or is not going to do when you have shared memory concurrent software running on top of it. So a couple of problems with the spec, some, some good things as we'll talk about in a second, but one problem is that it's imprecise. Um, that mostly comes from the fact that it's Engl written in English prose and not something a little bit more pinned down like the x86 TSO paper or things that we've been doing in labs. Um, but another interesting problem with these specs is that they're incomplete in a, in a way. Um, so there's many situations that you might want to reason about, but perhaps your piece of code that you hope to write doesn't look like an existing litmus test. So the litmus test doesn't tell you what to expect. And maybe it doesn't exactly fit any of the principles. So, now you're kind of stuck because no spec applies, but surely the hardware is going to do something in your case. The question is what? Um, so this is part of the problem with this style of specs. These are called axiomatic specs. And um, the way to think of these specs, the thing they're actually good for is that um, you imagine that your system, like we've been talking about in many lectures, your system evolves through many states. And that's the behavior you can sort of infer the behavior of your system through the states through which it goes. And axiomatic specs are basically sort of predicates on these traces. 
So for example, one of these principles or a litmus test could be phrased as a pattern. You look for this pattern in this execution, and if you find a litmus test looking pattern, well, if these three steps look like a litmus test and the outcome is not what the litmus test allows, well, you know, that is bad. This was not an allowed execution. And conversely, you might look through all the principles and all the litmus tests and every time you try to apply a litmus test pattern or a principles pattern in any execution, it all looks good. That means that you didn't find any problems, but the fact that it's sort of an absence of a problem is the reason why this kind of a spec is really incomplete because there's many traces where perhaps no litmus test is violated and no principle is violated. But nonetheless, maybe this is not actually a good trace. Uh, so this is the problem with these axiomatic specs is that they're good for checking executions against bugs, uh, but they're not so good for helping developers reason about their software because developers might not reason about things in terms of these execution sequences. And perhaps the sort of crispest example of how difficult it was for developers to reason about this stuff is this lock example. Uh, this is out of the paper. This is the spin lock that the Linux kernel had at some point in time. It's now a different spin lock implementation. Uh, but the, the puzzle really concerned this one line of code, the release. There's just a single store of the value one into the lock memory location. Uh, and the question the kernel developers are trying to figure out is, like, should this guy be locked or not? And the paper cites some crazy high numbers, like the Linux kernel developers had like hundreds of email messages they exchanged over two weeks and they couldn't figure it out until some Intel engineer came in and said, hey, you guys, you know, I'm from Intel. You don't need the lock instruction. That's the, and they believed him. Uh, and part of the reason why this is so complicated was that their question about whether the lock instruction is needed or not didn't actually fit any principle and didn't fit any litmus test. And they were stuck having to go back down to the hardware diagrams, like the kind of stuff we saw in an earlier slide, like here. And they were reasoning about hyper threads and store buffers and caches and interconnects and speculative execution. All this stuff came into picture for them. That's why it took them hundreds of emails. And coming back to this example, now that you guys understand x86 TSO, this is just beautifully simple, right? So in x86 TSO, the lock forces this write to go straight to memory instead of the store buffer. And if you go into the store buffer, well, then it's basically the same thing, except other threads don't see it yet. It'll take a little bit longer for your write from the store buffer to get flushed and be visible to other threads. So the question of whether it's locked or not basically boils down to like, do you want to sort of release to appear in memory right away or sort of later? A little bit imprecise, but uh, hopefully this gives you some sense of how the 686 TSO model makes it much easier to understand what the implications are of certain statements in your low level uh, weak memory model code. And here, perhaps if uh, x86 TSO was a clear spec for these developers, they would have thought that, well, OK, well, if we lock it, then we have a guarantee that immediately on release, someone else can grab the lock from memory. Otherwise, our write here can sit around in the guy's store buffer who released the lock. Maybe it's not visible yet to other threads. So it's mostly just a question of whether other guys can immediately grab the lock or not. Uh, and it'll be relatively easy, I think, to see correctness in this x86 TSO model, regardless of whether this instruction is locked. Make sense? Any Thank you for pointing out that um, assuming that it's really true that each one of these principles or litmus tests corresponds to a predicate on traces. What that says is that the conjunction of all of them is a perfectly precise spec. The problem yeah, perhaps, so I think what I meant is not that it's not precise. The problem, I mean, it's, it may not be true, but, but suppose it is true. Then the problem with the spec is not that it's not precise, it's that it's very difficult to answer questions from it. Good point. Yeah, illustrates yeah, the fact that pre precision is not the only, or maybe even the most important property of a spec. Usually, it's more important that you actually be able to understand it. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, so maybe hard to, you know, understand or internalize uh, is yet another problem of these axiomatic specs. 
Um, the, by imprecision, really, I meant the fact that these guys wrote it in English. Yes, right. Rose that's a little bit fuzzy, but you're absolutely right that uh, it is in principle, if we were to interpret their English as some precise way, we would get some kind of a decidable statement. It might be just a very difficult thing to decide, very difficult yeah, statement to decide. And the other thing that I think you're bringing up from the paper that turns out Intel was wrong on its own CPUs, like their own principles didn't always apply. <laughs> yeah, difficult to get the stuff right. That I believe has generally been the experience of hardware manufacturers that have relied on this kind of spec, that they discovered that the thing they built does not actually satisfy the spec. Yeah. All right, any other questions on x86 TSO, this paper as a whole? All right, so that's that for our intro to concurrency. So now we'll jump into other papers. So on Thursday, we'll read about how to find concurrency bugs and why these concurrency bugs might be tricky to find. And then we'll move on to more formal reasoning about concurrency to actually prove things about concurrent software. So uh, see you guys on Thursday.